Matthew 4, verses 18 through 22. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. Let me begin with a question this morning to you. Why did Jesus come to earth? Jesus came to earth to save us from our sins, right? Matthew 1, 21 tells us that. The Apostle John writes, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We are told in Luke's Gospel that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus came into the world to save the perishing, to rescue the perishing, as the hymn says. All right, let me ask you a second question. Through what earthly means does he do this work? Through what earthly means does he do this work of salvation? Well, the answer is he calls men and women to follow him. Okay, now let me explain. Salvation is the supernatural calling whereby the Holy Spirit works to regenerate the soul of a man by applying the merits of Christ's atoning work because of the electing work of the Father. Salvation is holy of the Lord. It is all of God, according to Ephesians 1. This is what some call the efficacious calling of God. It's effectual. It comes to pass. But that's not what I'm asking. That's not my, my question this morning. We have an expression that says, the ends justify the means. And without overanalyzing that saying, we can conclude that the end result, the ends are brought about by a particular means. In other words, an outcome is brought about by a prescribed method. So I'm not asking what is the result of salvation. That is not my question. I'm asking through what earthly way does God call men and women to salvation? That is my question. We find this answer in this morning's passage. Verse 19 says, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. God saves men effectually. He does by calling them. He says, Follow me. He calls them out of darkness. That is sure. But then he commissions those saved men to become fishers of other men for salvation. That is really the main point of this passage. Jesus commands his disciples to urgently follow him to make more disciples. That is the main point. We know that Jesus commands his disciples in Mark 16 to go into the, all the world and to proclaim the gospel to all creation. He commands his disciples in Mark 16, or excuse me, Matthew 28, to make disciples of all nations. And again, the Lord commands his disciples in Acts 1, you are my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Disciples making disciples. Men Fishing for men. This is God's ordained means of bringing about salvation. This is God's 
method, if you will, of salvation to his people. John MacArthur writes, The work of fishing for men and women out of the sea of sin, the work of rescuing people from the breakers of hell, is the greatest work that the church is called by God to do. The greatest work. Now last week we learned that Matthew begins in Jesus' second year of ministry. The apostle reminded us that God will save his people from every nation. Jews and Gentiles. And so Jesus begins to preach in Galilee of the Gentiles. But as we will see, he's not going to be the only preacher who's going to preach in Galilee of the Gentiles. Well, let's look at verses 18 and 21. I'm not going to spend a lot of time this morning on exposition. It's going to be a lot more of implication. What does the text imply? And also some application. Verses 18 and 21 say that while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And going on from there, Jesus saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, this is the apostle John, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and Jesus called them. Jesus himself is a Jewish Galilean. He is now living in Capernaum, living by the Sea of Galilee. This is a fishing community. Up and down that lake, that large lake, town after town, is made up of men who have businesses and bring in revenue through fishing. And Jesus is out along the lake one day fishing for men. And he's fishing for some particular men. His disciples that would become the apostles. Now many of the original 12 disciples were fishermen. But you may not realize the disciples in this passage. This is not the first time that they've met Jesus. This is not the first time they've seen him. No, in fact, they already know Jesus. This is not their initial calling. The initial call of these men is found in the Gospel of John. John 1, verses 35 through 51. There we read of the Apostle John and Andrew, Peter's brother, that they were disciples of John the Baptist. In fact, they were with John the Baptist on the day that John the Baptizer sees Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Andrew is so excited that he runs to his brother Peter and says, We have found the Messiah. And so it was in that day that the Apostle John, though he never calls himself by name in his gospel, he is there with another, and he's there presumably with his brother James also. These men already knew Jesus. And it is in John, John chapter 2, when Jesus performs his first miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. He turns the water into wine. And it was there we see in John 2 that his disciples, these same disciples, believed in him. It was when they were saved. It's when God redeemed them. Well, then what's going on here with Matthew's account? It seems like Jesus is just strolling along, sees these men and says, hey, follow me. And they get up and follow him. Why are they just now following Jesus? Why are they now just dropping their nets to follow him? Why didn't the disciples in John 1 and 2, why didn't they leave then and become full-time disciples? Well, this is where you have to put all the Gospels together. This is fun work. You have to take all those Gospel accounts and you have to put them together and to see exactly how the story flows. Now, everyone put their thinking cap on. 
in John 1 and 2, that was the first year of Jesus' public ministry. There the disciples believed. Again, salvation. They were saved. That's what occurred there. Yet they still must work. That was what we're going to call their initial calling to salvation. Maybe we'll call that phase one of their calling. Well, here in Matthew 4 and, and Mark 1, which again is his second year of ministry, notice here that Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. That's future tense. We can call this phase two. He's calling them, who he's already saved, to be his witnesses. Both phase one and two of these disciples' calling does not require them to leave their vocations. Martin Luther noted that John's theme, and Matthew's here, is not a calling of the apostles into office. This, rather, is a congenial association with Christ. It's a kindred, familial relationship with Christ. But then we have another calling we see in the Gospels. In Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. This is what we're going to call the third phase of their calling, if you will. And that calling will take place. Jesus will say to them, then... From now on, you will be catching men, present tense. And Luke goes on to say in that same text, and they left everything and followed him. It was at that time in Luke 5 when these disciples went into full-time disciple-making ministry, disciples who followed Christ. But here in Matthew 4, Jesus is commanding. He's commanding the brothers, Andrew and Peter, James and John, to become witnesses to him since they already know him as Messiah. And so the command goes forth. Follow me. Follow me. And the result, verses 20 and 22 tell us. Both sets of brothers immediately, immediately left their nets and they followed him. And immediately they left the boat and their father and they followed him. Now, he's commanding each disciple here to become fishers of men through evangelism. He's commanding them to be a witness to him. And by extension, we who are Christ's disciples, it applies to us today. We are to go and be fishers of men through evangelism. So what's the problem? We know what we're supposed to do. Fishers of men. We're to go and catch men. Disciples making disciples. It's nothing new to us. We hear this jargon. We have a straightforward command from Jesus. Then why... Is the church having difficulty being fishers of men? Why are churches dying? Why are there less conversions happening today than ever before? At least in the American church. I want to give you a lengthy illustration of this. It's a lengthy illustration that was published in a magazine in 1953. But I think it captures the problem. I think it captures the problem, and I think it also provides an answer to it. The writer of the article writes this. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a little life-saving station. The building was primitive, and there was just one boat but the members of that life-saving station were committed and kept a constant watch over the sea. When the ship went down, they unselfishly went out day or night to save the lost. Because so many lives were saved by that station, it became famous. 
Consequently, many people wanted to be associated with that station to give their time, talent, money to support this important work. New boats were bought, new crews were recruited, a formal training session was offered. As the membership in the Life Saving Station grew, some of the members became unhappy that the building was so primitive and that the equipment was so outdated. They wanted a better place to welcome the survivors pulled from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged and newly decorated building. Now the Life Saving Station became a popular gathering place for its members. They met regularly, and when they did, it was apparent how they loved one another. They greeted each other, hugged each other, and shared with one another the events that were going on in their lives. But fewer and fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions. So they hired lifeboat crews to do this for them. About that time, a large ship was wrecked off of the coast and the hired crews brought in for life-saving stations, they brought in boatloads of cold, wet, dirty, sick, and half-drowned people. Some of them had black skin. Some of them had yellow skin. Some spoke English well. Some could hardly speak it at all. Some were first-class cabin passengers of the ship, and some were deckhands. The beautiful meeting place became a place of chaos. The plush carpets got dirty. Some of the exquisite furniture got scratched. So the property committee immediately had a shower built outside the house where the victims of the shipwreck could get cleaned up before coming inside. Everyone's still with me? At the next meeting, there was a rift in the membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities, for they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal fellowship of the members. Other members insisted that life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of all those various kinds of people who had been shipwrecked or would be shipwrecked, they would begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And you know what? That's what they did. As the years passed, a new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a place to meet regularly for fellowship, for committee meetings, and for special training sessions about their mission, but few went out to the drowning people. The drowning people were no longer welcomed in the new life-saving station. So another life-saving station was founded further down the coast. History continued to repeat itself. And if you visit the seacoast today, you will find a number of adequate meeting places with ample parking and plush carpeting. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. Hopefully you caught the point of this. Sad to say, the modern church's evangelism is accurately illustrated here. Why has evangelism fallen on hard times? Is it because we're lacking training? Is it because we lack resources? Is it because we fear reasons that we surely use? But strip all that away. Strip those excuses away. What are we left with? We love our comforts. We love our buildings. We love our fellowships. You see, we have stopped being fishers of men and become lovers of self. Instead of loving our neighbors as ourselves, we just love ourselves. 
Central to evangelism is this, loving your neighbor as yourself. That is central to evangelism. You see, that command to love your neighbor as yourself, we get enamored with that last piece. But Jesus is saying that in the same natural way that each one of us love ourselves and care for ourselves, we don't have to be taught that. In that same way, we're to love our neighbors. That is central to evangelism. What is evangelism then? I want to talk about this. What is evangelism? What is this thing that Christ has called his church to? Have you ever asked yourself this? What is evangelism? Is it a group of Christians putting on a church-wide sponsored event like Trunk or Treat, Kids Fest, or an Easter egg hunt? Is it a community breakfast we're going to have? Or is it a barbecue? Perhaps or a hunting or fishing expo. Certainly a Sunday morning service or a Bible conference is doing evangelism, right? Now, church-sponsored activities, they can be wise. Sunday morning worship is commanded. But maybe we're not aware of a subtle shift that has taken place in the church. It is one that has pushed a strange worldly philosophy. It's pushed it down our throats without us even knowing. One that has its hands all over our worship and our evangelism and our hearts. This is a devilish philosophy and it's commonly called seeker sensitivity. Oh, This philosophy, it has swept the church. It has washed over the church like a tidal wave. It has captivated our minds, and we believe this is the method to winning people to Christ. Its basic message says this. We can sell Jesus to people by appealing to their desires. We can sell Jesus to people by appealing to their desires. That is its basic message. We can do this with the music that they like. We can do this with the preaching they accept. We can do this with the jargon they speak. We can do this with the buildings they like. We can do this with the trends they enjoy. Whatever it takes to get them in the door... Let them be like consumers who can pick and choose whatever attracts them off their own little human heart menu. And then we'll give them the Jesus message. It's the classic bait and switch technique. Bait them with what appeals to their desires, anything that people love, and then suddenly go all Jesus on them. Promising that all their problems will dissolve away if they will seek Jesus and just add him to their lives. But now listen. The Apostle Paul says something completely opposite of that. In Romans 3.11, he writes that no one seeks God. It means nobody This is referring to salvation. Nobody searches out and seeks God for salvation. Because Paul further says in Ephesians 2.1 that we are all dead in our sins and trespasses. And because we are already dead in our souls, totally corrupted by sins, we are incapable spiritually of loving God or even desiring him. Paul states in Romans 1.30 that in our natural state, we are haters of God. Every person who is dead in sin, every person who comes to an event, every person who is dead in sin and comes to those doors for a worship service hates God. 
They're dead, incapable of loving him, incapable of having desires and affections for him. They hate God. We must get this in our heads. This is the natural state of man. This is the predicament that we're in. This is what we're up against as a church. Becoming a man-centered seeker church instead of remaining a God-centered church, it poisons all of us and it's fatal to them. There's a pastor named J. Max Stiles and he remarks about this trend, this devilish philosophy He writes, the old seeker-sensitive movement and its modern replacements have it backwards. Churches are called to concentrate on God. We come here to concentrate on God as believers of God. While individuals, that's us again when we leave, while individuals are called to be sensitive to the so-called seekers. Listen, take worship. Who is worship for? It's for the triune God. It's for him. And worship, proper worship, comes from believers. They cannot and will not come from unbelievers. Every Sunday, our worship here is tailored for Christians. Born again men, women, and children who are spiritually enabled by the Spirit of God to worship God. We don't adjust our services for the lost. We do not dumb it down for the so-called seekers. We do not make our worship to be inclusive for all. Our worship is for God. And when we worship here, which encompasses all the elements of our worship, our main objective is to worship him. All the elements that you see in our our morning worship should point us to God. They should remind us of the gospel. Whether it's the scripture reading, or the songs, or the preaching, or the communion, or giving, or if it's in a baptism. These things, prayer, all point to God. These are reminders to you and me every week. This is why we have an order of service, an order of worship. The same thing week in and week out. They are reminders to you and me that he has saved us. And we are here to proclaim him to one another and to worship him with one another. Our Sunday service, our Sunday worship, listen, is not primarily about evangelism. We don't gather in this building to evangelize. That is not our primary function when we come together. We don't gather here to fish. We don't fish for men here. No, the command, the primary thing that we do when we come here is worship. Evangelism primarily takes place out there. Out there. That is the distinction. That is why the seeker-sensitive movement, they have it backwards. They come into a building and prioritize people who are lost, trying to get them, rather than worshiping God. They have it backwards. Evangelism is the means by which God prescribes salvation of men. I need to repeat that. It is through this means, evangelism, that God calls men, women, boys and girls into the resulting salvation that all belongs to him. It's what happens outside when we all go out to make disciples from the world. So let's define what evangelism is then, okay? Quoting J. Max Stiles again, I think he provides 
a most insightful and most helpful definition of what evangelism is. I think it's probably the most succinct definition I've seen and hits all the points. Are you ready for it? He says this, evangelism is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. That's it, Troy. That's it. The big, big hurrah. That's it. Not very exciting, is it? Evangelism is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. I think the reason that this definition might not excite us church folk is because we've adopted a faulty belief system more than we realize. You see, the church, we, we like a big splash. We like something to make some noise, some bang. We like a production of sorts. We need something that moves the needle. But Stiles says this. Now listen. A housewife meeting with a friend over coffee may be evangelizing. While a brilliant Christian apologist speaking to thousands in a church sanctuary may not be. Few see it this way. That's because we have a false understanding of what evangelism is. Defending the faith is fine. That's a fine thing to do. But it is easy to give apologetics for Christianity without explaining the gospel. We cannot evangelize without the gospel. To be a fisher of men requires me to engage every day in a normal, routine, rhythm of life type of way with unbelievers. A disciple searches for the lost to catch them for Christ by ordinary means, by things like establishing a relationship, talking to them, getting to know them, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself. Dare I say I could come here every Sunday and preach an evangelistic message every Sunday. And dare I say that you, by yourself, over lunch, talking to someone who's an unbeliever about Jesus, will have more fruit than me who preaches every week. Dare I say that? Expanding his definition for clarity, Styles continues saying this. He's going to go all amplified Bible on us here. Evangelism is teaching. It's heralding. It's proclaiming. It is preaching the gospel. That is the message from God that leads us to salvation. With the aim, with the hope, with the desire, with the goal to persuade, to convict, to convert, to convince. Evangelism is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. Furthermore, he states, listen, notice that the definition requires or does not require an immediate outward response. Walking an aisle, raising a hand, even praying a prayer may tell us that evangelism may have happened, but such actions are not what evangelism is. Because if any of the four components, teaching, gospel, aim, persuade, are missing, we are probably doing something other than evangelism. Honest question. Those four components, are any of those four components missing from when we have events here? Trunk or treat, Easter egg hunts, feeding the community. Are any of those four missing? Yes, absolutely. But we think we're evangelizing. We fed some people. Made some kids happy. We're at a church. No, evangelism is teaching mouth. The gospel. Ooh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. With the aim, the goal to persuade. That doesn't happen at the car show in the parking lot. 
Now, I'm not saying those things are bad. What I am saying is outreach events are the occasion for evangelism to take place. That is the occasion for evangelism to happen. That is the opportunity to speak to people, to know people, to make relationships with people. That is what outreach is for. And don't confuse the two. When Jesus said, follow me, he's saying, follow my lead. Imitate my teaching. Compel men like I do. In other words, my disciples, don't give them what they desire. What, don't give them the bait that they want. Give them the gospel. What's the gospel? Oh, that's got bad news and good news. We need to have a clearer understanding of what the gospel is. The gospel is not that Jesus has a plan for your life and Jesus loves you. That is not the gospel. The gospel has a basic message of this. God is righteous. He is holy. He is just. You, O oh man, are unrighteous, unholy, sinful. And God is angry with you. But there's good news. The good news is, in order for you to be brought out underneath the judgment of God, one has substituted his life. The one is Jesus Christ. The only one, the meritorious one, the one whose righteousness is able to cover your filth. And if you do not repent of your sins, if you do not trust in Jesus Christ alone as Savior, you will perish in hell under the judgment of God forever and ever and ever. Any gospel presentation that does not include the elements of God and man and the way to God through salvation in Christ, and if you don't, this is what's going to happen, is no gospel. No, we teach the gospel to sinners and we aim to persuade them. We want to develop a heart for evangelism. And we do this by following Christ's way. Do you ever think about Christ as being the greatest evangelist ever? He became flesh. For what purpose? To come down to earth. To condescend to sinful man in order that he could tell them the way of salvation. He is the greatest evangelist ever. You want to know the heart of Jesus when it comes to evangelism? We see it in the word. Jesus grieved over his people's unbelieving hearts in Matthew 23. He said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather you the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling there's angst there, there's anger, there's irritation, there's a pleading that's taking place. I want to do this, but you are hard in your hearts. Moses, in Exodus 32, after he comes down the mountain and sees the people worshiping the golden calf and they, and they attach it to God. This is our God and let's go ahead and have our feast and we'll praise God for this calf. He takes the tablets and he throws them on the ground and he breaks them. And he's so angry that he orders the Levites to go and kill one man from every family. And over 3,000 died that day. And then he pleads with God, don't wipe them out. Don't kill them off. Oh, Lord, forgive their sin. And if not, please then blot me out of the book of life. This was his heart for his people. I know I'm going to be with you, but if you will not forgive them, the hurt, the pain of them not going, blot me out. The Apostle Paul, he felt the same desire for salvation for his own brothers, his own countrymen. In Romans 9, you could hear the anguish in his soul. Hey, imagine speaking these words. 
I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit. Gospel truth I'm about to tell you. I have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They're lost. My heart pains. I am in deep anguish. I would rather be cut off and accursed like them. John Wesley, who's the father of the Methodist Church in England, he considered the whole world his parish. Imagine that. His whole world, the whole world. That, that's my parish. That's my field. That's where I go to. John Knox, he's the father of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. A thunderous preacher. He said, give me Scotland or I die. That is the heart of an evangelist. That is the heart of Christ. That is the heart of someone who is a disciple of Jesus when he says, follow me. And immediately they went. I'll finish with this. There was a late 19th century hymn writer named Philip Bliss. And he wrote this hymn called, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. And he wrote it based on a story that was told by the evangelist D.L. Moody. At one of D.L. Moody's meetings in America, he related the story of a shipwreck on a dark and tempestuous night when not even a star was visible. A ship was approaching the harbor of Cleveland with a pilot on board. The captain, noticing only one light as he drew near, and that light came from the lighthouse, the high lighthouse, he noticed that one light. He asked the pilot if he was quite sure that this was the Cleveland Harbor and that he could navigate into the harbor with just that one light. Because all the other lights that should have been burning on the harbor, they were out, they were extinguished. The pilot replied that he was quite sure Whereupon the captain inquired, then where are the lower lights? Gone out, sir, said the pilot. Can you make the harbor then, asked the, the captain again. And the pilot answered, we must or we'll perish. Bravely, the old man steered the vessel upon her course towards safety. But alas, in the darkness of the harbor, he missed a channel and he struck upon the rocks and in the stormy waters, ripped the hull open and many of the men on that ship died. This is when Moody made his appeal to his audience and he said this, Brothers, the master will take care of the great lighthouse. Let us keep the lower lights burning. Moody is saying this, Church, the Lord will bring about the ends of salvation by himself. He is the great lighthouse. He will bring salvation. He is the upper light in heaven that burns as brightly as ever. But what about us? The lower lights. Do we burn as brightly? Then he left the question. And so I ask you, the great light burns as brightly as ever, but what about us, the lower lights? The means by which God brings about salvation. Please pray with me.